There is a need in large productions such as modern day AAA games to play it safe. Investors play a big part in this as they'd much rather put their money into a project that has all the appropriate buzzwords at the time. For example, I've no doubt there was a period there during the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era where the words cover-based combat did wonders for opening up investor wallets. These are, after all, not people interested in games or artistic integrity. And you've only got to look at the landscape of popular online shooters filled with battle passes and loot boxes, or the absolute abomination that is Diablo Immortal, to confirm that sentence that I just said. When making a sequel, there is also a need to give the audience what it wants, or at the very least what it thinks it wants. Given that The Longest Journey, a PC-only title, shipped over half a million copies, easily making back its two to three million dollar budget, getting the sequel greenlit probably wasn't much of an issue. But what to actually do with that sequel? Now, that's a question. The Longest Journey was a narrative-driven, point-and-click adventure game, and thanks to seven years of time passing and a new console generation changing a lot about how we played games, it wasn't going to be just as simple as giving people more of the same. The point-and-click adventure game had all but faded away, and the keyboard and mouse and the DualShock analog pad was now how things were done. So, things were going to have to change, especially if Funcom was serious about releasing on consoles, which they absolutely were at the time. There are certainly plenty of stories to tell in worlds as wild as Stark and Arcadia, but given our girl April literally thwarted the machinations of dragons, cults, and all kinds of other things to stop the balance from being utterly destroyed, I'd say we're going to be very hard pressed to find us a Ryan level threat to deal with. As such, creator Ragnar began pitching ideas for sequels that focused around a new female protagonist who was actually on a quest to find April Ryan, as a way of both bringing new players into the world and hopefully giving returning fans more of what they wanted. It took several iterations to get right, but finally, a pitch that everyone would be happy with was eventually settled on and production was begun. So, without further preamble, why don't we see how it came out? This is Dreamfall. Before we get started, I'd just like to post a quick warning here that this video will spoil some of the plot points about the Longest Journey game. So if you haven't played that, then I'd advise you to go and do just that before you get started on this video. There will no doubt be some light spoilers for Dreamfall here too, but I'm not going to be taking you on a play-by-play -play of the story as, just like in the first game, I think it's something best uncovered for yourself. We can't, however, really talk about this game without having some idea of who the new and returning players are and what the conflict is. So why don't we go ahead and get on with that. So there were several interesting writing challenges presented when making a sequel to The Longest Journey. First, there is the often common issue in games of escalation. In The Longest Journey, the fate of not one, but two worlds is threatened, and while April Ryan certainly has a lot of developing to do as a person, she'd reached a kind of mastery in her role as a shifter, walking between the two worlds. Certainly, she seemed somewhat lost after fate was finished using her as an instrument, and life on Stark seemed… sketchy. You see, by the end of the first game, April was being hunted by the Church of Voltec, and had also all but sold herself into corporate slavery to get a ticket to an off-world space station and the Syndicate doesn't take kindly to people backing out of those deals. On the other hand though, she had finally, in a way, reconciled her past with her father, and with all her new knowledge, maturity and power, she was staring down a future of infinite possibilities. Something that was clearly very intimidating to her. In Silent Hill and Max Payne 2, the issue of escalation was handled by telling smaller, more introspective stories about characters undergoing significant personal development. Even if Rockstar did just decide to say to hell with all the character development Max went through in the second game and reset him to being upset about his family again. Dreamfall is to some degree a story of the same nature. It's more focused on characters and personal struggles than on world-ending events. Dreamfall and Dreamfall Chapters are actually two parts of one story, and you can rest assured that by the end of this saga, the stakes have soared and even overtaken anything that the first game had to offer. But in this first part at least, things are much more grounded. Well, I'd say about as grounded as a story about travelling between two worlds can get anyway. 
A big part of this is our new protagonist Zoe, who's just getting introduced to all this and serves as a good jumping on point for new players, especially because Dreamfall released on the Xbox and was responsible for introducing the game and the worlds to filthy console peasants. I'm sorry, I meant to say my fellow gaming brethren on the consoles. Zoe's adventure starts when her on and off boyfriend Reza, a reporter writing for an anti-syndicate newspaper, goes missing, and she briefly finds herself caught up in an assassination attempt on a scientist in a lab before falling under the scrutiny of the ever-watchful eye. Much more of Zoe's story takes place on Stark than April's did. We visit several locations on her journey, including revisiting Newport's Venice, and even the old boarding house where April was living, and it's... Yeah, that stung a little. We also travel all the way to Hokkaido and Russia, as we uncover a tangled mystery based around a powerful tech company called Watikor, and their big new interactive entertainment system, the Dream Machine. Another big hook in Zoe's quest is recurring visions of something straight out of a fear game. She's seeing white noise and some kind of twisted house, complete with its own Sadako, who has one command for Zoe. Find her. Save her. Find her. Save her. What was that? And believe me, this one Better? gets dark. Yeah. While the longest journey kept true to much of the light-hearted tone so prevalent in point-and-click adventures, things start to shift here. This is especially true in Arcadia. While the wisecracking crow does make a return in this game, I couldn't help but want to say, man, now really is not the time when he started with his quips in this one. Things have changed a lot in Arcadia. We actually begin our exploration of this place as the one and only April Ryan, and oh boy, has 10 years changed her. Yes! Anyone else getting real T2 vibes out of this? The primary conflict in Arcadia concerns the massive Azadi force now occupying Mercuria, and the scrappy ragtag group of rebels who are fighting back. This is a lot more complicated than it first seems though. So, in The Longest Journey, the primary antagonists on Stark were the Church of Voltec, an organization headed by one of the four Drake kin. In Arcadia, they are known as the Vanguard, and their primary goal is, was, the reunification of Stark and Arcadia, and a return to former glories, which, let's be real, is always a very bad idea, as so-called former glories only exist as a sugar-coated memory of what the world once was. Towards the end of the game, Mercuria is attacked and occupied by an invading force called the Tyral, operating on the Vanguard's behalf. The Azadi actually came and liberated Mercuria from the Tyral. They welcomed its former occupants back, and set up a garrison to protect the city from further attacks until life had returned to normal. And then, they just… didn't leave. The problem here is that the Azadi are deeply religious, incredibly prejudiced against magicals, and very intolerant of faiths that differ from their own. So, during their occupation of Mercuria, the Azadi have outlawed the sentinel religion of the Northlands, enforced their own beliefs in their one goddess, and confined the magical races to a ghetto that is routinely and violently raided by their soldiers. The victims of these raids are taken away and never seen again. They're also building this massive tower, but we'll talk about that in the next video. So April and a large contingent of disgruntled magicals have formed a resistance and are now running a guerrilla war against the Azadi. In retaliation, the Azadi have dispatched an elite warrior known as an Apostle to purify her through rebirth. No need to guess what the initial requirements for that are. We do actually get to control Kian Alvane at several points in this game, but he's a much more important character when we get to chapters. So, those are our primary conflicts. In a way, they're very much more human than what we had in the previous game. Illegal research and dangerous new technology and an occupying army trying to erase an entire culture may not be world-ending, but it's very grounded and far more complex in scope. In the longest journey, April needed only bring the right person to the Tower of Balance that they ascend to become the new Guardian, and the plans of the Vanguard will be thwarted for another thousand years. Here though, 
it's just not so simple. It's nice to imagine that a scrappy group of rebels could overpower a much greater force by, for example, simply taking out their leader, or maybe blowing up some super weapon. But the reality of it would be that the death of a leader would simply lead to the ascension of another. At best, there may be a temporary recall of troops to consolidate strength in the homeland while a new leader was being decided on, but once it was done, you know they'd be back, and in force. Likewise, the megacorps of dystopian sci-fi are beyond reprimand. They are the true power in these worlds, while democratically elected officials are just puppets that put on a facade of democracy so that people think that they have some kind of say in how the world works. This way, the population just buys their new smartphones and don't ask questions about the way the world is really run. Exposing illegal research or shady dealings may cause a minor bump in the road, but nothing is really going to change in the end. So, it's all pretty bleak, and not as gamey this time. There's no MacGuffins to find or prophecies to fulfill either, and what could these two seemingly separate narratives possibly have to do with each other? Well, there's a small hint at the start. You see, in the first game, we encounter a drunk from Stark named Brian Westhouse in Arcadia. He mentions he was displaced in time when crossing from one world to the other by traveling through the Dreaming. And in this prologue, we discover he wasn't 100% forthcoming about that. What? God. What is that? What? So that's our setup. So why don't we meet our new queen on the board and get acquainted with Zoe Castiel? So this is Zoe. This is how we meet her. At the end of her journey. Locked in a coma and yet somehow aware of what's going on around her. And she wants to tell us the story of how she got here. And man, if that isn't one hell of a hook right there, well, I don't know what is. I got a letter. The name on the envelope said Mary. So, while there's plenty of things to say about Zoe in general, I think one way to look at our introduction to her is by contrasting it with what we got when we met April back in the first game. We meet both of them half-dressed in their bedrooms, and maybe this is the first moment where we can start appreciating the game's, ahem, <coughs> higher resolution. So, while this isn't some lavish queen-sized bedroom with a walk-in closet, Zoe's certainly better off than April was. Now sure, the room's a mess, but it doesn't have the underlying sense of desperation that April's little box overlooking murky canal water had. When we met April, she was a nearly broke art student, who had run away from home to put herself through college while staying in the cheapest room she could find, which she funded by pulling shifts as a waitress in a cafe bar, and hanging all her hopes for the future on her big art exhibition that was coming up and no real idea of what she'd do if that didn't work out. Zoe, on the other hand, has a very comfortable existence. She lives in the glorious city of Casablanca in northwest Africa, which clearly has none of the air pollution problems that Newport had, and is positively uplifting even by the standards of the nicest parts of that place. Her home is spacious, and she is cared for by her father, though her mother is noticeably absent. Unlike April, who was determined to make it through college and pursue her dream, Zoe recently dropped out and is now drifting with no real direction in a kind of limbo. She wakes up late, lounges around her house half naked all day while watching the screen in her room. Meanwhile, April had to share a screen in the common room with everyone else in the building she lived in. And while Zoe does a lot of complaining about being bored, she doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. Zoe also has this cute AI robot friend named Wonkers, who's been a kind of surrogate parent and best friend to her since she was very young. And while April had this charming example of the human race hitting on her, Zoe has this real stand-up, on-again, off-again boyfriend named Reza, who's either got the patience of the Buddha and the capacity for forgiveness of the Christ, or is just a massive simp who needs to be told he can do better, because she is messing him around a lot. 
On the surface, April and Zoe seem like polar opposites. Zoe has everything April didn't. A loving father, a nice home, and free reign to do what she wants. April was abused and escaping a violent household. She was scrappy and driven, yet still hampered by low self-esteem. Zoe is just directionless, and more than happy to sponge off her dad and mess around with Reza's feelings rather than actually get her shit together. So, are you thinking I don't like Zoe? Trust me, nothing could be further from the truth. I love this girl. Her coming from a more privileged start than April doesn't mean she doesn't have problems, and I can relate 100% to feeling hopelessly dissatisfied with everything and drifting completely directionless through life, unable to get really motivated or excited about anything. It's called depression. And Zoe may not be there yet, but she is well on her way. If, by chance, you just stopped and asked, what does this privileged little girl have to be depressed about? Well, congratulations on not understanding depression at all. Yes, Zoe has a comfortable existence. Something that can be very hard to break out of, especially when you see just how much regular life takes out of people. But simply existing in comfort is not the same as living or thriving. It's very likely at some earlier point in her life, following in her father's footsteps as a bioneer felt like a real dream. But discovering that wasn't what she wanted completely derailed her life and left her floundering and distrustful of any other desires to achieve something. The girl really needs to take action to break out of this, but with our bodies programmed to embrace comfort and shy away from resistance, well, you can see a kind of vicious circle here, spiraling all the way down to the bottom. Fortunately or unfortunately for Zoe, depending on how you look at it, events conspire to prize her out of her docile life and into one of action, and ultimately leading to her stepping across the divide into the magical realm of Arcadia. While I've accused Zoe of being inconsiderate with Reza's feelings, potential danger leveled at the guy is more than enough to spur her into action, even up to sending her rushing more than halfway around the world, infiltrating dangerous crack houses, tangling with the all-powerful Syndicate Eye, and even infiltrating the headquarters of the powerful Wati Corp. And remember guys, this is dystopian sci-fi here. Corpos are a law unto themselves, so the consequences of getting caught are as severe as they could be. It's not that Zoe is unbelievably brave, and she certainly isn't physically imposing or some kind of action heroine, but she's clearly very determined, and maybe even just a little stupid, which makes her willing to venture into very dangerous places in order to help both her friends and the larger world as she uncovers the sinister plans of Wati Corp. I could say more, but I already feel like I'm tiptoeing around spoilers here. Let's just say I was very satisfied with who Zoe had become by the end of this. In truth, I think all of that was already there inside her, and no doubt had she been motivated to deal with normal things in her life, she'd be a straight-A student and a Taekwondo gold medalist. But that simply isn't her real talent, or where her calling lies. When playing The Longest Journey, I found myself musing on April Ryan and the role of the Chosen One, and how the status of being a prophesied hero all but removes agency from a character who is just being buffeted around by the winds of fate, and also how a Chosen One is often chosen to maintain or even restore a kind of status quo against some monumental change. This being fantasy, showing change as something objectively bad is quite easy, but in reality, Change is just the natural state of the universe. And while great change can be painful, the end of one thing is ultimately the beginning of something new. Embracing this and letting go of what came before can lead to something even greater growing out of the rebirth, while clinging onto something long past its time can lead to it growing stale and rotten. This is where I've actually got to give Dark Souls a little bit of credit. While a chosen undead, or ashen one, may be tasked with restoring lost glory and returning the world to a status quo, it is heavily implied that this is not such a great thing overall, and that letting the fire simply die may be a painful but ultimately necessary transition into whatever naturally comes next. I guess when dealing with a chosen one, it's important to consider just who did the choosing. Have I mentioned how much I like this book? So, I'm glad I was playing Dreamfall when I was writing the script for my last video, 
because when I saw what became of April, my pen came to a screeching halt and I realized her story was far more complex than it first seemed. April never got her happy ever after at the end of the fairy tale. It was actually heavily implied by Lady Alvane when she rescued April in a moment of seeming deus ex machina that this would be the case. Once April was no longer the instrument of fate and she had to figure out her own path again, things got sticky. She didn't go back home and have a great reunion with her family or finally get together with Charlie and make it as an artist. Far from it, in fact. She abandoned Stark and her old life entirely for one in Arcadia. And given all she'd done in the name of Mercuria, she wasn't about to stand around and let a bunch of bullies oppress the magical races within the city. And ten years of war have changed April a lot. One early and striking revelation is that she has taken lives. In The Longest Journey, the most she did was trip the Gribbler so it fell into its own cooking fire and trap Roper Clax in a calculator. But now, she's a fighter. And to the Azadi, she's a dangerous terrorist. April's priorities seem to have shifted somewhat too. She seems resentful of the role fate thrust upon her in the previous game. And so, when Zoe does show up and the implications of something threatening the balance presents itself, she flat out rejects it and moves to send Zoe back to Stark as quickly as possible. This may seem at odds with the scrappy girl who trudged across half of Arcadia to find the Alation people, but there's some sense to it. I mean, 10 years is a long time after all, and people do change a lot. April took the initiative in getting involved with the Azadi fight versus being pulled into the previous struggle for the balance. She's grown close with the Magicals, being something of a special creature herself. She clearly has no taste for this kind of injustice, and this is a monumental struggle against a much more powerful foe. So it's little to no surprise that she feels she doesn't have time for the balance when she has so much resting on her shoulders and so many people to care for. While for us, the player, April's transformation is a little shocking, especially playing the games back to back. We do learn some things about her transformation from Crow. This wisecracking bird was April's sidekick and skeleton key for a lot of puzzles back in the first game. And he recounts to Zoe some of the story that happened between the two games, right up to the point where April basically walked out of his life. In the end, people change. And so does the world. And when it happens, we can't simply go back to how things were before. All we can do is keep moving forward into whatever comes next. April has become a driven and very competent woman, which does beg the question, what's this all about? Find April. Save April. There's no damsel in distress here. In fact, it's April who breaks Zoe out of the evil tower, but not before bumping into this guy. They believe they have a right to impose their politics and religion on others, and they even believe that we should be grateful for it. We'll talk more about Kian in the next video, I think. So, we're going to be tackling two things here. First are the changes to the worlds of Stark and Arcadia, and second, the presentational bump the game got from being ported to new technology. So why don't we start with the fun stuff? Both Stark and Arcadia have changed a lot. Of course, we are introduced to this wonderful new hub world of Casablanca at the start of the game, and compared to Newport, it seems so full of light and has a very positive, upbeat vibe to it. The towers on the horizon have this striking utopian feel. Now, yes, we could see some of that in parts of Newport, but we spent most of our time seeing exactly what that world has been built directly on top of. And in Casablanca, even down at the bottom, it seems like a pretty nice place to live. It's safe, it's clean, it's comfortable. And yeah, there were definitely similar vibes in April's Venice, but this place feels like it caters to wealthier tastes. People with the money to buy a nice house, providing it's a little out of the city centre, and who take on a longer commute in exchange for extra comfort. Kinda like... Hmm, Zoe's dad. We only visit a few locations in this area, all told, including Liv's shop, which is small and messy and feels like you could find anything you wanted if you spent enough time rummaging around in there, 
Zoe's kickboxing school, where we get our first taste of the combat mechanics, and a nice coffee shop. And while we only spend a small amount of time here, we should probably be aware of just how thin the illusion of peace and safety in this world actually is. Go, go, go! Hands behind your head! Listen, I, I warned you! Sure, the police in Newport didn't mess around either, but this is some next level Soviet North Korea shit right here. Even in such a nice part of the city, the eye is clearly very powerful, and concepts like human rights don't really matter to them. People may not be living in fear of just being picked up off the street and disappearing at night, but it's quite clear that things like that do happen. As a returning player though, things started to get really exciting for me when I finally got to return to Old Venice and... Ouch. We discover through playing the game that there was a kind of global event called The Collapse that happened 10 years ago, right around the time April Ryan vanished off the face of Stark, and, as some of us may be aware, two dragons fought to the death in the skies above Newport, and a new Balance Guardian ascended to protect the two worlds. While it's never explained what The Collapse actually was, we know that things like interstellar travel became impossible, and even super-fast airborne travel on Earth suddenly stopped working. This is actually a pretty fascinating event, specifically because so little is actually said about it, and a lot of people don't really remember what actually happened. Zoe herself was kept inside by her father, which implies something changed in the sky, but what actually happened is a mystery. In the wake of this, places like Venice have fallen into ruin, and the student boarding house that was once a sanctuary for young progressive minds looking to change the world is now a crack house full of dangerous people. The only place that seems to have survived is... I'm all scrubbed and ready to work, sir. And look who's running the show. So, it seems dance didn't exactly work out for Charlie, and when the harsh reality of rent and bills came calling, he fell into something else. Now, if you've watched this video on my channel, you'll know I wouldn't consider this to be any kind of failure. Charlie took a journey, and maybe he didn't end up where he thought he was going, but he had a great life experience and made some lifelong friends along the way. And in the end, he landed on his feet. Honestly, it was great to see his change, though he's clearly affected somewhat by April's disappearance. Emma also puts in a brief appearance, and she, much more so than Charlie, hasn't been able to let April go. In Arcadia, the occupation by the Azadi has led to things taking a pretty sharp downturn there too. But, can we just take a moment to appreciate this? So, with the power of the Xbox gone are the beautiful pre-rendered backgrounds from The Longest Journey, now replaced with equally beautiful full 3D environments. It's a big transformation, and revealed very well indeed. When Zoe first arrives in Arcadia, she's deep underground in a vast cavern, Forgotten City-style complex. And it's only when she's figured out the riddle of this place that she's able to emerge somewhere else. Somewhere that hints at familiarity, safety, somewhere we've maybe been before. Open one more door, and we are back in the Journeyman Inn, and standing in the presence of Ben Rime Selim, a woman who played no small part in April's journey. She's certainly looking a lot better at this point, and our initial exit into Mercuria is this grand spectacle that only hints at the troubles ahead. Just for a moment, we can enjoy this wondrous place once again, and maybe get a little sense of coming home. I mentioned in my first video about my absolute love of pre-rendered backgrounds, and their ability to capture a scene, but there's definitely a limitation to what can be expressed through static images. Seeing Arcadia rendered in full 3D like this, and just being able to look around and walk through doors and around corners that were previously concealed from view, 
really pushes the sense of scale and wonder in this city. And since we've segued into graphics here, well, you may have noticed the character models are significantly better this time around too. In The Longest Journey, the characters were very low poly, but were very easy to read. This is one of those shining through your limitations rather than being held back by them moments. The artists leaned into how little they could actually express on any single model, and so focused on making sure each model was unique and communicated what it was very clearly. There's a worry that when those limitations get removed, people can get lazy or maybe too excited and begin over-designing characters so that they just look like a cluttered mess and don't communicate anything important. I'm happy to say that's not the case here at all. All of that extra power has been put to great use. I mean, just look at April's hand-me-down Arcadia does from the first game. Now, look at her here. This is a woman ready for battle. She looks far more mature and focused than her previous incarnation. It would have been easy to add things like buckles and straps or a stupid shoulder pad because it might look cool, but stuff like that only takes away from a design rather than adding to it. Her getup is simple and easy to read. It's clearly meant for outdoors and comfortable movement, and probably provides more protection than you'd realize. Seriously, gambesons, for example, despite being just layered fabric, were pretty useful in a scrape. See this video for more details. The main problem though is the animations, especially the faces. This is, of course, a limitation of the Xbox and not a complaint that's unique to this game. But yeah, we've got moving mouths and not much else, which definitely feels pretty robotic and somewhat in the uncanny valley. Still, as Mass Effect Andromeda taught us, it's just as possible to mess up going the other way as well. So aside from a few low resolution textures here and there, and some robotic animations, I'd say the presentational upgrade is one of this game's strongest points. And while I'll always love my pre-rendered backgrounds, I enjoyed exploring this Mercuria a lot more than I did the one in The Longest Journey. So, as I said, we step out into our winter wonderland and start to think maybe it's all gonna be okay. Which is why it really sucks when we start to see stuff like this. The city is now fully occupied by the Azadi, and the Temple of the Balance and the Sentinel Priesthood who guided April Ryan through her journey to save the balance are no more. In place of the temple now stands a towering edifice built in the name of the Azadi Goddess, and the Azadi enforced their religious belief ruthlessly on the people of the North. Mercuria was once a haven for all races. As a major port city, it was a melting pot of culture and religion. Now humans and magicals are segregated with non-human magicals confined to a ghetto that is regularly raided and its occupants taken away for re-education. Sounds kind of familiar. Within though, we see signs that life is carrying on as best it can. The magicals still run their market and still trade, albeit less openly, in their crafts and talents. Arcadia is the real nostalgia hub of the game. Of course it's where we find April and Crow, but we also bump into other returning characters, such as the now reformed, wink, Ropaclax. Yes, the evil alchemist whom April trapped in a calculator has escaped, amended his ways, and even wrote a book about it. I have mixed feelings about this, actually. On one hand, it was a much needed break in the tension and a wonderful callback to the longest journey. On the other, it is a little jarring when compared to the rest of the game. I mean, things get very dark by the end of this. While we don't travel as far across Arcadia as we did in the previous game, we do get to spend a lot more time with the Dark People, and even visit their grand floating city, which is where the reborn White Dragon now resides. We didn't really get to learn much about the Dark People in The Longest Journey, on account of only spending a very brief time with them, and them not really wanting April to bother them. Here, we finally get to learn about their culture, purpose, and even their sleeping arrangements. The Dark People are collectors of stories. Written stories, to be precise. Any kind of story, in any kind of language, that is written, painted, carved into stone, or written in sand with a finger, is the purpose of their existence. The Dark People, by their own admission, do not make stories themselves. They only gather, store, and read all the stories from all the races across Arcadia. And I could see this being a wonderful retirement plan for myself. I just need enough money to construct a colossal floating library 
and I'll be sorted. Only when the final words have been written, and the worlds of Stark and Arcadia are reunited, will they rest from their task. So, this was a great ride all in all. There were plenty of deep cuts and lore expansion for returning players, while still being a great introduction to the world for new people. On top of that, we got a big improvement to visual quality that made this trip just as enchanting as our first one. So, this is a big one. In truth, as well as wanting to finally explore these worlds, a big reason I chose to do a series on The Longest Journey is that each game is a kind of milestone marking the progression of the adventure game as a whole through the years. For better or worse, each game was released on a different console generation and was made with a somewhat different audience in mind. Each of the Dreamfall entries has some experimental features and these land with varied success. The Longest Journey was a point and click adventure game. This is a very well established genre and people basically know what they're going to get from these right down to how the game controls. Adventure game, however, well, let's take a break for a second. Go ahead and open a browser window. No, seriously, you'll enjoy this. And search for something like original Xbox, PS2, or early 2000s adventure games. And then, after you're done gushing over the list of absolute bangers that show up, this could take some time, but I'll wait. Why don't you tell me if you can figure out what the fuck an adventure game actually is? Because searching those terms, I find RPGs, immersive sims, action and stealth games, and sure, all of these are adventures. Hell, Animal Crossing is kind of an adventure, right? But they don't give us a clear idea of what an adventure game actually is. So without the point and click element, we really are heading into unknown territory. Honestly, aside from Shadow of Destiny, I'm struggling to think of any other games in this era that remotely resemble Dreamfall. Much like the first game, I'd say that when judged completely on its own merits, Dreamfall is just fine. It's clearly here to tell a story first, and it's both an incredible story and very well told. At the time of its release, it was one of a very small number of, mostly, non-combat narrative adventure games that was trying to offer an original take on the point-and-click adventure game, and update the old genre for consoles and new technology. In that regard, I'd say it succeeded. But as before, I'm also interested in how it holds up in 2022, and what someone trying to make something similar now might want to take, and might want to leave. Despite the change in control scheme, our two big returning features are conversations and inventory puzzles. This game does have combat and stealth mechanics too, but... Well, we'll get to them later. So, both the returning features have been streamlined, and some might say, dumbed down. Certainly, there's no more unintuitive moon logic puzzles, and while that's a great thing, we may have swung the needle a little too far the other way depending on how you look at it. Basically, there's pros and cons to this, and we need to talk about them both. So, let's talk about those conversations. In the last video, I talked about how conversation trees are basically pointless. There's a few games like Vampire or Persona where the choices you make here will have serious gameplay implications, and then... One moment you're running like the wind, then you've suddenly turned around and are giving him the finger, furiously, with both hands. Why? There's this game. Oh yeah, this is happening very soon. But for the most part, it's just a big list of stuff to click on every now and then without really thinking about it. So in Dreamfall, they're more or less gone. Not entirely, but they're cut back to a bare minimum and some of the choices you get given are one-time only deals which lock you out of other choices later. So this is a lot less cumbersome overall, but... And this is a big but. While they removed all the conversation trees, they didn't cut back on the overall amount of dialogue. So you're going to spend a lot of time just watching people talk. Now, I'm not 100% sure on how much of a criticism this is. After all, this is what you should expect from a game like this. You're basically playing a movie, moving between set pieces and solving some challenges along the way. This is exactly what you'll be doing in a point and click adventure, only instead of clicking through topics, you're just getting the whole conversation delivered in one click. 
As with the first game, the voice acting is on point, and thanks to the full 3D environments, the camera can easily jump around and do close-up and dramatic shots to keep the scenes interesting to watch. But you are still watching something versus playing something. And while that's okay, I just feel like maybe we could be doing a little better. Puzzles have also been massively simplified, which is both a good and bad thing. The positive here is gameplay flow and pacing. We are able to move from scene to scene at a good pace and uncover this story without having to spend hours standing around scratching our heads, revisiting every area of the game for something we might have missed, trying to combine every item in our inventory with everything else, before finally tabbing into a browser, looking up the answer and screaming, how the hell was I expected to figure that out? But the problem was never the complexity of the puzzles, as it was if they were intuitive or not. The Longest Journey had a kind of layered puzzle design. What I mean is this. Let's imagine your game has a door, and you need a blue key to unlock it. So before we can open the door, we need to find the key. The key is in a guard's coat pocket, so we need to get rid of the guard. The guard is thirsty, so maybe we can slip him something in a drink. So we need to find a drink, and something to slip into it, and so on. We can add more steps going further and further back until we have several hours of game in a relatively small area. This part is fine, providing it's within our power to reasonably deduce each step along the road to success. Following each step requires exploration and maybe interactions with characters, which creates an opportunity for world building. The problem with some puzzles in The Longest Journey, and a lot of these old school games, is that the alien logic that the puzzles were built around just made them insufferable to deal with, and is a big reason why the genre fell from grace. So in Dreamfall, most of that is gone. There aren't many steps from lock to key, and you usually have some clear idea of what you need and a good idea of where to find it. In a lot of cases too, we're going into minigame territory. Zoe has a hacking tool for electronic locks, and a lockpick for others. Clearly, she graduated from the JC Denton School of Awesome. These are not particularly bad. The lockpick game is overall more fun than the hacking one, and both are about on a par with any other hacking minigame. These are a little overused if you ask me, especially at the start of the game. There are several points early on where Zoe comes up against a lock that's a grade higher than her current version of the hacking software. but. Rather than go through some elaborate system of puzzles to get the upgrade, you just need to call your hacker friend back in Casablanca and have her drop a big update onto your phone, which is almost completely pointless. Most of the puzzles are pretty straightforward. Like when you need a ticket for this cable car in Hokkaido, you clearly see this guy tear up a ticket and throw it in the garbage. While Zoe comments that these things automatically incinerate rubbish every few minutes, there's no timer on the puzzle, and you don't need to find any special tool to fish the ticket halves out of the bin. You just need to click on it a couple of times and then find something to stick the two halves together with. So while something is gained, something is lost. There's not a whole lot of challenge here, and your enjoyment will really depend on what you want most out of the game. I'm a story first gamer, but I still want a game to play and there were definitely times when I felt like this game was trying my patience in that regard. There's a later point in the game where all three playable characters are converging on the same point for a big climactic moment, and all you have to do is walk each one to the same place and maybe have a conversation with someone along the way. Now sure, a big convoluted puzzle here would have killed the pacing, but having basically nothing to do other than taxi three different characters to the same place, with no way to divert from the path or enact any kind of player agency on the scene, was also incredibly frustrating. So it's definitely not perfect, but in the interest of enjoying the story, I guess it's okay. The stealth and the combat though, that's another story. So I don't want to dwell on this area too much because it's quite clear that the developers didn't either. But Dreamfall has both basic combat and stealth, and a game over condition. And with the exception of one section where April is sneaking through some ruins filled with dangerous creatures, they're not very well implemented, and not at all fun to use. I don't think I need to go into too much detail about just how hard it is to nail down good combat in a game. If you've watched my series on the Legacy of Kane games, you'll know that their combat was a real mixed bag of hits and misses that changed from game to game. 
I'm honestly not sure what these things are doing here. I'm wondering if they were mandated by forces higher up the chain of command, or if Ragnar was looking to experiment and just didn't have time to get it right. Either way, the combat is really stiff and clunky, both in its controls and animations. And the stealth is the worst kind, which is forced upon you in certain set pieces but completely useless outside of those, and uses a simple stay hidden or die condition. That is to say, if you are seen, you're dead, and you're going to have to go through the entire game over screen process and reload your save. It really doesn't add anything to the game at all, if I'm being honest. It's not that all the stealth scenes are bad, as I said, there is at least one good one, but this isn't an immersive sim. You don't get to choose how you approach a problem and progress to the next set piece. This is one specific key for one specific lock, and all the doors open in a very specific order. So yeah, it's not good, and I'd rather just leave it there than try to make any larger point about it. Sometimes people just make mistakes. Fortunately, these systems aren't used all that frequently, and so aren't all that invasive to the experience. Dreamfall was a great experience overall, but while many things were gained in the presentation department, some things were lost in the overall gameplay. Some straight up mistakes were made too, but I can't exactly blame Funcom for wanting to experiment with a formula, especially since they were heading into unknown territory. The difficulty needle definitely swung too far in the wrong direction this time too. However, I do think we need to look at the larger world in which the game was being developed at the time. Point and click adventures had died out for several reasons, and absurd moon logic puzzles had played a part in that. My guess is that Ragnar and other devs working on the project had to consider this when making the game, and how comparisons to point and click adventures might impact marketing given the unfavourable way those games were viewed at the time. Game development, especially large expensive titles, just isn't as simple as having a vision and sticking to it. Zoe's story has a very interesting ending. I mean, we know where she ends up from the very start of the game, and she is in fact now in a space between the realms of Stark and Arcadia, telling this very story to this gentleman right here. It's a kind of cliffhanger ending. Much like with Legacy of Cain and Deus Ex Mankind Divided, there was a sense of the battle is over, but the war is not yet won. And if you stick around, there's more to come down the line. Only, there wasn't because that larger world once again shoot things up. While Dreamfall did just fine commercially, it wasn't the money-making powerhouse of, say, an MMORPG, and Funcom made the decision to switch up their focus from single-player adventures into online multiplayer games, with their major entry to this market being Age of Conan. While a concept for Dreamfall chapters already existed, Ragnar was moved on to working on The Secret World, which is a solid MMORPG and I recommend you give it a try sometime, but this meant we wouldn't hear anything from Zoe, April, Stark or Arcadia for seven years. And next time, we'll be seeing if that final product was worth the wait, as we finish our exploration of the world divided in two, and see the ultimate conclusion of these stories in Dreamfall Chapters. Hello to you late stayers. I see you lurking in the backseat wondering if there's a whole surprise video hidden somewhere around here. Well, sorry to disappoint. We are approaching the end of the year, and I've probably got two more stories to share before we tick over into 2023, unless I get an idea for something short and fun to cover before then. For now though, I'll just say thanks to all of you who keep coming back and commenting. I really appreciate it. If you did play along with my little challenge to search for early 2000s adventure games, let me know in the comments which game you saw that really played on your nostalgia. And to the other creators who I have semi-regular banter with on the Twitter space, thanks guys. You know who you are. Oh yeah, I'm on there if you'd like to follow me. Don't forget to do all the stuff for the channel, but for now, Arkham Rides.